Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening episode of Pursue, and this is Pursue 19, which is Hematology, Hemostasis, and Thrombosis. We are streaming live from Amrita Institute, Kochi, via Kolkata. We have a very interesting topic today, which is hereditary fibrinogen abnormalities and von Willebrand disease. To talk on that, we have Dr. Karthika K. V. She is an MBBS MD path, DNB. DM and hematopath from Ames, New Delhi. Presently, she's an assistant professor in the Department of Hematopathology at Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Kochi. And her areas of interest is coagulation disorder, hemolytic anemias, flow cytometry, bone marrow failure syndromes, myeloproliferative neoplasm, myelodysplastic syndromes, molecular hematopathology. She's got multiple publications in national and international journals and several book chapters. She is also the reviewer of Indian Journal of Hematology and Blood Transfusion and has been the zonal quiz master for ISHBT zonal quiz in the year 2019. Before I ask Madam to start, let me request all of you to please keep your mic muted, your camera off and please don't share your screen. With this, let me request uh, Dr. Karthika ma'am, please share your screen and let's start. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nadeem. Uh, hope my screen is visible. Yes, ma'am. Please, please start. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, uh, inviting me to talk on the Pursue platform for the second time, and uh, it's my pleasure to join you once again. Today, uh, we'll be uh, talking about a very important topic. Uh, that is von Willebrand disease and hereditary fibrinogen abnormalities. Uh, so since we are dealing with hereditary disorders, I take the liberty of restricting my topic to inherited von Willebrand disease. So from this slide, I uh, hope you can understand that von Willebrand disease can also be acquired. Okay, Though rare, there is an acquired form of von Willebrand disease, which we need to keep in mind. And uh, with that, I start today's lecture. We'll start with von Willebrand disease followed by fibrinogen abnormalities. So a little bit on the history of von Willebrand disease. So this disease was named after uh, Dr. Eric Adolf von Willebrand. He's a Finnish physician and uh, uh, he was the one who discovered the disease in 1926. He described this disease first in the paper hereditar pseudohemophily so it was a hereditary condition and he was the first person who distinguished it from hemophilia and uh, described in his paper that this is just a disorder which looks similar to hemophilia but is not hemophilia and uh, this is how he, he differentiated it from hemophilia he observed that there was a lack of joint bleeds in von willebrand disease and there were more of mucosal bleeds and menorrhagia in this disease so this is why this disease has been named after dr eric adolf von willebrand and interesting fact about this disease is that the disease, though it was discovered in 1926, it was not until 1985 that the molecule was actually discovered. The von Willebrand factor was discovered almost uh, uh, half a uh, century later, and the deficiency of that protein was then attributed to von Willebrand disease. So, how did he discover this disease? This disease was first identified in a family in the Eland Islands in the Baltic Sea. So the first patient who presented to Dr. Von Willebrand was Hordis. She was a five-year-old girl who presented with uh, complaints of significant uh, nosebleeds, gum bleeds, and ecmotic patches. And uh, she actually expired at the age of 14 due to uh, severe menorrhagia. And uh, Dr. Von Willebrand, with the help of uh, the natives of Eland Islands, tried to draw up a pedigree chart of that family and identified that almost five females in the family had died due to excessive menstrual bleed. And he also identified the autosomal dominant nature of this disease. And uh, 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 this was a landmark paper in the discovery of von Willebrand disease following with similar cases were reported. 
So to give an introduction, von Willebrand disease is the most common inherited bleeding disorder. And uh, no matter what, every bleeding woman, every woman who presents with menorrhagia or epistaxis or gum bleeds should undergo a basic investigation to rule out von Willebrand disease because I strongly believe that von Willebrand disease is a routinely missed and routinely underdiagnosed condition. So the von Willebrand disease is due to qualitative or quantitative defects in the protein called von Willebrand factor. And it has prevalence of 0.6 to 1.3%, which is likely to be underreported. There's no geographical influence on the incidence. No population is exempt from von Willebrand disease. Even in India, the prevalence is similar. It has an autosomal inheritance, unlike uh, uh, hemophilia, which has a sex-linked inheritance. It's more common in females than males, and this is due to the specific hemostatic challenges like uh, pregnancy, uh, menstruation, etc. in the females. And there is a marked phenotypic variance, which is why there is a lot of underdiagnosis in this disease. The patient may present with severe bleeding, but there might be no such history in the entire family. So that is why the diagnosis may be missed and we might work up the patient for other causes. So before we go on to the disease, we need to know about the protein that is the von Willebrand factor. So first, uh, we'll uh, have a, a brief discussion on the gene which encodes the von Willebrand factor. So. Uh, the take-home message from this slide will be that the von Willebrand factor gene is a large gene. So this has implications because genotyping has very limited role in the diagnosis of von Willebrand disease. One reason is because it's a large gene which has 52 exons and it is present on chromosome number 12. And the second reason why it, genotyping is difficult with von Willebrand disease is that there is a pseudo gene on chromosome number 22 which has similarity from exon 23 to 34. So for this reason mutations in the von Willebrand genes are not easily detected. So as you can see this is the gene for the von Willebrand factor it has 52 exons and it encodes different domains of the von Willebrand factor protein. Now, this is the protein. You can see an amino terminal and a carboxy terminal. We shall see the structure of this protein in more detail in the coming slides. So, uh, if we go to the synthesis of von Willebrand factor, the synthesis of von Willebrand factor happens in three cells. It happens in the endothelium, in the platelets, and in the megakaryocytes. In these cells, once the uh, uh, factor is synthesized within the nucleus, it is known as a pre-pro-VWF. This pre-pro-VWF has a signal peptide, a pro-peptide and a mature segment. Once this protein moves to the endoplasmic reticulum, there is folding and post-translation glycosylation followed by removal of the signal peptide. So the basic purpose of the signal peptide is to guide the transport of the von Willebrand factor to the endoplasmic reticulum. So once that happens, the signal peptide is removed. Then after that in the endoplasmic reticulum, there is a dimer formation. So the dimer formation happens at the carboxy terminal. Following this, the uh, protein is transported to the Golgi complex and multimerization happens. Now, multimerization happens at the amino terminal. So that is why it's known as the N-terminal multimerization, followed by the cleaving of the propeptide segment. So finally, you have a mature von Willebrand factor multimer, which lacks the signal peptide and the propeptide. So this is known as the mature von Willebrand factor subunit. And this is then either secreted freely into the plasma or is stored within the alpha granule of a platelet or in the weevil palate body of an endothelial cell depending upon where it is synthesized. So this is just an electron microscopy showing the weevil palate bodies within the uh, endothelium which are the storehouses of the von Willebrand factor. Now, it's important to know about the Weibel palate bodies because in the 
therapy of von Willebrand factor, we use desmopressin. This molecule, desmopressin, actually facilitates the release of von Willebrand factor from the Weibel palate bodies, and that is how it is used in the von Willebrand disease. So, from the previous slide, we understood that there are several domains in the von Willebrand factor protein. And it is important to understand these domains because defect in the makeup of every domain contributes to a different type of von Willebrand disease. So this is the entire protein. It has an amino terminal and a carboxy terminal. Starting from the amino terminal, it is named as D1 domain and D2 domain, which forms the propeptide. And this part is absent in circulation. So as we saw, this is cleaved within the Golgi complex. So once the von Willebrand factor is secreted into the circulation, the propeptide is no more present. Then there is a D prime D3 area which is the site for the binding of factor 8. So from the structure of the von Willebrand factor, we can actually understand the entire function of the von Willebrand factor. So the D' D3 end actually binds factor 8, which goes to say that von Willebrand factor serves as a carrier for factor 8. Then you have a D3 site, which is the site for multimer formation. So we had already seen in the previous slide, there is a multimer formation at the end terminal end that happens in D3. A1, A2, A3 are the domains which come up next. A1 and A2 actually form the site for the binding of platelets through the receptor GP1B alpha. So here comes the next function of von Willebrand factor. The von Willebrand factor binds to the platelet through the receptor GP1B alpha and helps in platelet addition. Now, where is the other end going and attaching? A3 goes and attaches to the collagen, type 3 collagen to be more specific. Now, this refers to the next function of von Willebrand factor. So it actually helps in bridging the platelets with the collagen or the subendothelial collagen which is exposed on endothelial injury. Meanwhile, A2, A2 has a specific site for binding of Adam TS30. Now, I'm sure everybody will be knowing about the molecule Adam TS13. It's a endogenous molecule which helps to break down the ultra large multimers of von Willebrand factor. We don't want von Willebrand factor to be roaming around in the circulation in the form of ultra large multimers because that can cause thrombosis. So the uh, body has uh, an endogenous enzyme, a metalloprotease enzyme which cleaves these ultra large multimers of von Willebrand and that cleaving site is what is present within the A2 domain. And the site, to be more specific, is a uh, site between the tyrosine and the methionine amino acids in this position. Then you have the C1 domain. C1 domain binds again to the platelets, but here it binds through the uh, GP2B3 alpha receptor of the platelet, thereby helping a little bit in platelet aggregation. And then you have the CK domain, which was the site of dimer formation as seen in the previous slides. So in this slide, you can actually understand the structure of the von Willebrand factor, the function of the von Willebrand factor, and the metabolism of von Willebrand factor. So we shall discuss this in more detail in the coming slides. So the next, this slide actually tells you uh, uh, what are the uh, variability in von Willebrand factor in patients with different blood groups. Now this is important to understand because uh, uh, when you're testing for von Willebrand factor, the normal levels vary with the blood group of the individual. Now why does this happen? In the synthesis of von Willebrand factor, if you had noticed, glycosylation is a very important step. Now, glycosylating enzymes are present in patients with A, B blood groups and absent in patients with O blood group. As a result, patients with A, B blood groups have much more heavier glycosylation and in turn, this glycosylation protects the von Willebrand factor from Adam TS13 induced degradation. 
So you can see in this picture, Adam TS13 attacks the von Willebrand factor much more easily in patients with O blood group because they are less heavily glycosylated. Whereas in patients with A or B blood group, what happens is the uh, binding site for Adam TS13 is heavily glycosylated and thereby they are protected from Adam TS13 induced protein degradation. So the take home message is that the patients with O blood group are likely to have low von Willebrand factor levels even in a normal individual. So what are the other factors which affect von Willebrand levels? Other than the blood group, there can be racial or ethnic differences. There can be certain genetic polymorphisms like in the gene CLEC 4M and SPXBB5, which affects the clearance of von Willebrand factor. Patients in, with these genetic polymorphisms have increased clearance of von Willebrand factor and they might have a low level. And age also affects the levels of von Willebrand factor in the sense that von Willebrand factor increases with age. And von Willebrand factor is also uh, an acute phase reactant and therefore it increases in all acute phase situations like in pregnancy, inflammation, menstruation, etc. And also drugs such as OCPs, hormonal drugs, steroids can elevate levels of von Willebrand factor. Now, it is important to know this because whenever you are measuring von Willebrand factor, we need to make sure that these endogenous and exogenous factors are taken care of. Next, we move on to the function of von Willebrand factor. So, uh, before that, I just want to project the normal coagulation cascade in our body. So whenever there is endothelial injury, the first step will be vasoconstriction. Now, why do you need vasoconstriction? One thing is to reduce the amount of blood loss through the endothelial defect. And the second thing will be to concentrate the platelets and other coagulation factors at the site of endothelial injury. Followed by vasoconstriction, we have the next step, which is the primary hemostasis or platelet blood formation. During this step, the platelets get activated. They have adhesion, activation and aggregation happening, which finally results in the formation of a primary hemostatic plug or the platelet plug. This is followed by secondary hemostasis. Now, why do you need secondary hemostasis? Because primary hemostatic plug is not strong enough and therefore it has to be reinforced by the fibrin mesh. Now the process of formation of fibrin mesh is known as the secondary hemostasis where a coagulation cascade is triggered resulting in the production of thrombin. This thrombin converts fibrinogen to fibrin and this fibrin reinforces the platelet plug forming a secondary hemostatic plug. The next step in this is a fibrinolysis and clot degradation because you don't want the clot to be extending to areas where it is not required. So in a normal hemostatic mechanism, not only is it important to form a clot at the site of endothelial injury, but it is also important to limit the formation of clot so that it does not spread to the areas where there is no injury. So this is the entire spectrum or the entire uh, single shot of the uh, normal hemostasis happening in our body. Now, where does von Willebrand factor come here? It comes in two places. It comes in primary as well as in secondary hemostasis. In secondary hemostasis, it actually serves to carry factor 8. Now factor 8 is a coagulation factor which is involved in secondary hemostasis in the coagulation pathway. So what is the uh, uh, purpose of carrying uh, 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 von Willebrand factor carrying the factor A? It actually helps to increase the half-life of factor A. So what happens is a von Willebrand factor has a binding site for factor A and this binding helps to increase the half-life of factor A. 
So this goes to say that a patient with low levels of von Willebrand factor will also have low levels of factor VIII. The uh, and this is important to know because once you identify low levels of factor VIII, you should do a von Willebrand factor level before calling that patient as a hemophiliac. Maybe the patient actually has a von Willebrand disease, which is what is resulting in a low factor VIII levels. So that is the role in secondary hemostasis. The much more important is the role in primary hemostasis. So in primary hemostasis, what happens is when there is an endothelial injury, we all know that there is exposure of the subendothelial collagen. Now this subendothelial collagen exposure activates the von Willebrand factor and as we already described the A3 domain of the von Willebrand factor comes and binds to this collagen and once this binding happens uh, though the von Willebrand factor is bound there is a flow of blood through this constricted vessel so because of the vessel constriction there is a high shear rate of flow in these vessels and because of this high shear rate the multimers of von Willebrand factor unfold. So this unfolding exposes a larger area of the multimer causing many platelets to bind to this unfolded protein and this binding of platelets results in activation of platelets and shape change of platelets thereby concentrating platelets at the site of injury. So that is how Von Willebrand factor has a role in platelet adhesion and aggregation and that is why Von Willebrand factor has areas or binding sites for the platelet glycoprotein receptors namely GP1B and GP2B3A. So these are the two functions of Von Willebrand factor, one in secondary hemostasis and one in primary hemostasis. Next is uh, once the function is done and dusted, we now know that von Willebrand factor is existing as multimers. Now we don't want this to happen because these multimers are going to attract platelets and they might form in vivo thrombi. So uh, in order to avoid this, we have the Adam TS13 molecule which breaks these uh, von Willebrand factor protein into small, small segments. If this Adam TS activity is lost, such as happens in TTP, there can be aggregates of von Willebrand factor and platelets press, uh, produced in the circulation resulting in thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. So this brings us to the diagnosis of von Willebrand disease. Now that we are well versed with the structure of the protein, it will be easy for us to understand the diagnosis and classification of the disease. Now, the classification of von Willebrand disease was put forward by the International Society on Thrombosis and Hemostasis in the year 2006, and that is what we follow till now. And uh, this is uh, mainly based on the laboratory uh, uh, features of the von Willebrand protein. However, in recent times, though this still holds true, we also need to consider the symptoms and the genotype of the patient. So this is how the classification of von Willebrand disease goes. Type 1 is the most common type of von Willebrand disease and it is characterized by a partial deficiency of von Willebrand factor. So this results in a mild to moderate disease being a partial deficiency and it is autosomal dominant in nature. Type 3, now let's come to type 3. Type 3 is again a quantitative defect but here it is not partial, it is complete absence, complete deficiency of von Willebrand factor and this accounts for only 5% of the cases and it is usually a severe disease. Also, the inheritance of type 3 is autosomal recessive which contributes to the severity of the disease. So, type 1 and type 3 are quantitative defects, whereas type 2 refers to qualitative defects in uh, von Willebrand factor and this contributes to 25% of the cases. Now type 2 based on where the qualitative defect is, it's again classified into four types. Type 2A, 2B, 2M and 2N. 
बिकॉज एम एंड एन साउंड द सेम I will give the full forms of these two M. M stands for Multima and N. N stands for Normandy. Normandy was the place where this was first discovered. So I will try to use the terms two Multima and two Normandy whenever I am describing type two M and two N. So type two A. Now what is type two A? Here actually there is a deficiency of high molecular weight Multima. So now. Well, from the previous slide, we were able to understand that multimerization of von Willebrand factor is essential for its function because that is what helps us to increase the surface area of the uh, platelet binding. So, if there is a defect with the multimerization of von Willebrand factor, there is going to be a deficiency in the high molecular weight multimers, and therefore, there is going to be a reduced platelet adhesion. So, this is type two A. Type to b this is a gain of function mutation here what happens is the uh, site which binds the platelet gp1b so uh, uh, that site gains a function mutation and thereby binds platelets more voraciously than it is normally supposed to so because it's a gain of function mutation it keeps binding platelets even when it is not required and this results in consumptive thrombocytopenia so the platelets are continuously being bound to the von willebrand factor and consumed and this results in thrombocytopenia which is a very characteristic feature of type 2b this is also autosomal dominant so type 1 is autosomal dominant type 2a is autosomal dominant type 2b is also autosomal dominant type 2 multima type 2 multima here the problem is the multimerization happens but still the platelet adhesion is defective so that is what is your type 2m next is type 2n normandy which is due to the defect in the uh, site uh, where factor 8 binds so therefore factor 8 does not bind to von willebrand factor this is how your qualitative defects in von willebrand disease are classified as type 2a 2b 2 multima and 2 normandy type 2a there is deficiency of high molecular weight multimers type 2b there is increased binding of platelets to the von willebrand factor resulting in thrombocytopenia type 2 multimer there is no deficiency of multimer still there is a defect in platelet adhesion type 2n is because of defect in binding of von willebrand factor to factor 8 so here the inheritance everything is autosomal dominant except your type 2 normandy and type 3 so type 2 normandy and type 3 are autosomal recessive whereas type 1 type 2a 2b and 2 multima are autosomal dominant so again a slide on the mechanism of the disease like as to what mutation causes the different diseases type 1 is usually due to missense mutations and they are heterozygotes that is why they express in autosomal dominant fashion there can also be certain mutations which cause faster clearance of von willebrand factor that is von willebrand factor is synthesized at a normal rate but because of faster clearance these patients present as if there is a partial deficiency of von willebrand factor next is type 3 where there are null mutations the both the genes are affected uh, and uh, being in autosomal recessive condition it presents in the homozygous or compound heterozygous state type 2 is due to uh, uh, functional defects in the very various binding sites and result in qualitative defect in von willebrand factor there is no reduction in the levels of von willebrand factor so pictorial pictorially this can be represented as follows so this is how in a healthy person the von willebrand factor is present as multimers and here and there you have factor 8 binding so in type 3 they are uh, null allele so no protein synthesis happens in type 1 again there can be null alleles but if it, it affects only one of the alleles so the other allele synthesizes normally so there is reduced synthesis or the other mechanism can be missense mutations where there is 
either an increased intracellular retention of von Willebrand factor or enhanced clearance of von Willebrand factor. So this also can result in a type 1 phenotype and it is specifically classified as type 1C or the Vizenza variant. Vizenza is actually the name of the place where this was first discovered. So this is known as the Vizenza variant of type 1 von Willebrand disease where the synthesis actually happens at a normal rate but due to increased intracellular retention or increased clearance they present with a type 1 phenotype. Then you have the type 2. First, type 2 way. So, as I told you, there is deficiency of multimers. That is because of a mutation in the multimerization site at the amino terminus, which is the D3 and the A2 domain. It can also be in the propeptide area, the CK domain or the A2 domain. In the A2 domain, when there is a mutation, what happens is they are susceptible to proteolysis by Adam TS13. So, uh, depending upon where the mutation is, the defect can be either in the multimerization, in the dimerization, or due to enhanced proteolysis by Adam TS13. So, all of these defects result in a type 2A phenotype. What is that phenotype? A deficiency of multimers of von Willebrand factor. Type 2B, this is caused due to missense mutation in the A1 domain, a gain of function mutation where there is increased binding of this A1 domain to the GP1B alpha resulting in consumption of platelets due to enhanced spontaneous binding and thrombocytopenia. Next is type 2M where there is a missense mutation in the A1 domain resulting in decreased platelet addition. Now, the difference between type 2 multimer and type 2A is that there is no loss of multimers in type 2 multimer, whereas there is a loss of multimers in type 2A von Willebrand disease. And type 2 Normandy is due to missense mutation in the D prime D3 domain where factor 8 binds. So, this results in decreased factor 8 binding. Now, the, the specific uh, characteristic feature of type 2 Normandy is that because the defect is actually in the binding of factor 8, these patients actually present just like hemophiliacs. So, because uh, the ultimate defect here is the deficiency of factor 8. So, uh, these patients uh, usually present just like hemophiliacs and it is important to differentiate between the two. So, this was the classification and the mechanism of the disease. Next, coming to the clinical presentation. So, in the introductory slide, I had told you that there is a marked phenotypic variance in von Willebrand disease and therefore, it becomes important to know that so you don't misdiagnose these patients. So, why is there a marked phenotypic variance in these patients? That is because of the uh, uh, different factors which affect the von Willebrand factor level. So, the, there can be a blood group, there can be the age factor, there can be the uh, drug factor, uh, there can be uh, the acute phase reactant factor. So, the endogenous von Willebrand factors are in the influence of several uh, influencing factors. So, this can affect the presentation of the disease. And uh, but depending again on the subtype, the presentation can vary. Like I told, type 2 Normandy can present like hemophilia wherein the patient presents with joint bleeds and deep bleeds, which is characteristic of hemophilia rather than von Willebrand disease. This again can lead to misdiagnosis. So, uh, in a classical case, patients usually present with mucocutaneous bleeds. In children, it's characterized by EC bruising, epistasis, gum bleeds, etc. In others, there can be hematomas, menorrhagia or bleeding from wounds. Especially in females, menorrhagia is an important symptom and many of these patients may be diagnosed only when they present with menarche. In 60 to 80 percent patients, especially in type 1 von Willebrand disease, bleeding can happen only on hemostatic challenges like surgeries or dental extractions. So, this again should uh, trigger the workup of a von Willebrand disease. So, this is just a bar diagram showing the different symptoms in the different type of von Willebrand disease. 
uh, it's predominantly mucocutaneous, uh, uh, such as epistaxis, bleeding from minor wounds, gum bleeds, GI bleeds, bleeding from dental extractions, post-operative bleeds, menorrhagia, postpartum hemorrhage. Whereas you can see that deep bleeds like muscle hematomas, joint bleeds, and CNS bleeds are commoner in type 3, whereas less common in type 1 and type 2. Now, why is it commoner in type 3? Because type 3 is characterized by complete deficiency of von Willebrand factor, which means that these patients are also likely to be deficient in factor 8. So, that is why type 3 patients present with a hemophilia-like presentation. So, uh, the, it's important that we consider all factors in the diagnosis of von Willebrand disease. Patients usually have bleeding symptoms along with reduced factor levels or reduced uh, antigen or a reduced function. It can be anything with a positive family history. Now, this is a run of the mill case where you get bleeding symptoms, reduced von Willebrand levels, and positive family history. Unfortunately, this is not true in daily practice. In daily practice, you might not have bleeding symptoms, you might not get classically reduced levels of von Willebrand factor, and you might never get a positive family history. So, how do you go about this? So, the potential problems in the diagnosis of von Willebrand disease are a vague or incomplete bleeding history. The threshold to call von Willebrand factor to be normal or reduced and non-contributory family history. So how do you circumvent the problem of a bleeding history? So bleeding history, you need to take a thorough bleeding history, you need to take, take history of medications, underlying medical conditions which may uh, contribute to bleeding, physical examination to identify bleeds and you need to objectify this. History is always subjective but how do you objectify this? For this reason, there is something known as BS and BATs. Now, BS stands for bleeding scores and BAT stands for bleeding assessment tools. Now, these are tools which have been created with the purpose of objectifying the symptoms of the patient. So, the purpose of these bleeding assessment tools is to uh, make a system systematic objective assessment of the patient's bleeding symptoms it has a high negative predictive value now why do you need a high negative predictive value these tests are not done in every laboratory and they are not cheap tests so you need to justify performing these tests in these patients because von Willebrand factor being a common disease you cannot forgo testing for it at the same time it's not easily done as well so, in order to select patients in whom you are going to do these tests, you can make use of these bleeding assessment tools. Now, this picture actually shows uh, uh, several assessment tools that have been created over the years. Right now, what we use is the ISTH back tool. ISDH is the International Society for Thrombosis and Hemostasis and uh, it has 14 categories of bleeding with a score of 0 to 4 in each category. A total score has to be determined and any score more than 4 in males, more than or equal to 5 in females, more than or equal to 2 in children justifies testing for von Willebrand disease. Now this is actually available on the internet and it can uh, the, the web based tool itself can calculate the score. So you just need to uh, ask questions to the patient and keep selecting what score it is. So uh, there are 14 symptoms. Now let's see just one symptom starting from epistaxis. If there is no or trivial epistaxis the score is zero. If it is greater than 5 per year or more than 10 milliliters, then you give it a score of 1. If it uh, warranted a consultation, then you give it a score of 2. If it required packing or cauterization or a, a prescription of a drug, then you give it a score of 3. If the patient required blood transfusion or replacement therapy or a desmopressin to increase von Willebrand factors, then you give it a score of 4. So, every symptom is uh, graded similarly and the total is calculated and if the total is uh, more than or equal to 4 in males, more than or equal to 5 in females, more than or equal to 2 in children, then we need to test for von Willebrand disease. Next, coming to the cutoff for von Willebrand factor. 
So anything uh, uh, between 50 and 150 international units per deciliter is normal and anything less than 30 international units per deciliter is abnormal. Now what about the 30 to 50 gray area? Here this can include a mixture of both normal and abnormal patients. Now how come normal patients have 30 to 50 as I already told you? Patients with O blood group are likely to have 25% lower von Willebrand factor levels and therefore these patients can fall in this category. And also 2.5% of the normal population can have a low von Willebrand factor but they might not have a bleeding history. So it is very important that you always diagnose von Willebrand disease in the light of the bleeding symptoms of the patient, positive family history and other laboratory features. So this area is what you call it as low von Willebrand factor, possibly type 1. So that is where your 30 to 50 comes in. These patients may or may not have bleeding symptoms and they are unlikely to have an abnormality in the von Willebrand factor gene. Then why do you uh, diagnose these patients? Why do you label these patients as low von Willebrand factor? That is because it does not preclude the diagnosis of von Willebrand disease if there is supporting clinical or family evidence and it does not preclude the use of agents in patients who are at risk of bleeding. So this goes to say that even if the patient has a 30 to 50 international unit per deciliter, you identify that these patients did not have any abnormality in the von Willebrand gene. You still can use agents like desmopressin or von Willebrand factor concentrates in these patients if they are at a high risk of bleeding. Next is the problem of the family history. Family history, if uh, present is highly uh, useful for the diagnosis of von Willebrand disease, but usually not available in most of the cases. This is because uh, family members may have minimal symptoms or minimal hemostatic challenges, especially males, they are likely to have less hemostatic challenges and therefore are likely to be misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed. Sometimes it may be masked or ameliorated and sometimes they may not be exposed to a hemostatic challenge and sometimes family members will not be aware. Next, we come to the laboratory diagnosis of von Willebrand disease. So post-clinical presentation and your bleeding assessment tool. If you are to test for von Willebrand disease, you need to go in a stepwise manner. Every coagulation uh, uh, defect for that matter requires a stepwise approach. You don't directly go to uh, measuring the von Willebrand factor levels or you don't directly go to measuring the uh, restocytin cofactor activity of von Willebrand factor. There must be a stepwise approach because there are clues which you can get at every level of testing. So in that uh, context, the preliminary tests which are used for the diagnosis of von Willebrand disease, if you do a complete blood count, if the patient is a severe bleeder, they are likely to have anemia. So the severity of the bleed can be assessed from the degree of anemia in the patient. And type 2B patients usually have a low platelet count. Just to recall, type 2B is due to increased affinity of the von Willebrand factor to the platelet GP1B alpha receptor resulting in increased and spontaneous platelet binding and consumptive thrombocytopenia. Next, if you do a screening coagulogram, that is your PT, APTT and TT, you, you might have a normal or prolonged APTT. Now, this prolongation of APTT is solely due to the deficiency of factor 8. This reflects the function of von Willebrand factor in secondary hemostasis. So, secondary hem uh, von Willebrand factor is a carrier molecule for factor 8 and therefore, if von Willebrand is less, factor 8 is also less and this will result in a prolonged APTT. Bleeding time, though very useful, is obsolete because it is rarely performed properly these days. So if you are to perform a proper bleeding time, then it is prolonged in patients with von Willebrand disease. Next is PFA 100 or 200. PFA stands for platelet function analyzer. It's a screening instrument where you actually have a cartridge which is coated with platelet agonists and then blood is made to flow through this membrane. 
and uh, because of platelet activation the aperture within the membrane gets blocked and the time for the closure of the defect is measured so this is actually a screening test uh, for uh, uh, von willebrand disease though it might not detect every type of von willebrand disease next is definitive testing so preliminary testing you have the complete blood count the screening coagulogram the bleeding time and the pfa 100 200 now we come to the definitive testing in definitive testing we have three lines of testing the first line second line and the advanced testing the first line testing includes von willebrand factor antigen level platelet dependent von willebrand factor activity which is also known as the von willebrand factor recoff activity the stocytin cofactor activity and the third test in this category is the factor 8 levels the second line of testing involves repa and multimer analysis repa ripa stands for ristocytin induced platelet agglutination and then you have the advanced testing where you have von willebrand factor factor 8 binding assay von willebrand factor collagen binding assay von willebrand factor protopeptide assay and genotyping which are highly advanced and rarely done so we will uh, see each of these tests in detail now first is the von willebrand factor antigen levels now what are you doing here you are measuring the actual amount of antigen in the plasma it is a elisa based method and it can also be done through an automated latex immunoassay a normal is 50 to 200 or 50 to 150 depending upon the lab and in type 3 it's usually undetectable in type 1 where there is partial deficiency it is reduced that is less than 30 international unit per deciliter in 2a and 2b again it can be reduced in 2 multima it is normal or reduced in 2 normandy it is normal now the take home point from this slide is in type 1 it is definitely reduced in type 3 it is markedly reduced because these two are quantitative defects but in the different categories of type 2 which are qualitative defects the antigens may or may not be reduced so this is just a picture showing how this elisa is done you actually have a plate where a, a, a antibody to von willebrand factor is immobilized then you add your sample the von willebrand factor binds to this primary antibody and then you sandwich it with a secondary antibody which is bound to the house radish peroxidase and based on a color reaction you detect the amount of von willebrand factor so this is the elisa similarly you have a latex immunoassay where the latex particles are coated with antibodies to von willebrand factor and the latex aggregation is then proportional to the level of von willebrand factor so the two methods used for measuring von willebrand factor antigen are your elisa and latex immunoassay the most commonly used method is latex immunoassay because this method can be used in automated coagulometers the next test which is used in first line testing for von willebrand diseases platelet dependent von willebrand factor activity now what does this measure this actually measures the function of a von willebrand factor so we all know that the primary function of a von willebrand factor is binding to the platelet and this is what is measured in this assay now how do you do that this is done with the help of ristocetin ristocetin is actually uh, a, an antibiotic which was used previously now it is used for this test only it's not used in uh, uh, as an antibiotic anymore so ristocetin actually has the property of agglutinating platelets so if ristocetin is present in the system and your platelets are agglutinating it means that the von willebrand factor is functioning properly so in the presence of ristocetin von willebrand factor binds to platelets so ristocetin is actually a stimulating factor for platelet and von willebrand binding so this is actually a functional assay 
which measures the aggregation of platelets in the presence of risotecin and it's directly proportional to the von willebrand factor levels in the plasma this is in a normal person so a uh, normal person if he has 50 international units of uh, uh, a von willebrand factor antigen the risk of activity also is likely to be somewhere near 50 international units because the entire antigen is functional and binding to platelets normally okay so but there are there are inherent limitations in this assay because it is difficult to standardize it is not sensitive if your von willebrand factor is less than 15 international units per deciliter and it's dependent on the type of risotecin and the platelet gp1b now just a picture to show how this is done here you have a latex particle on which uh, 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 the uh, antibody to uh, your gp1b the glycoprotein receptor gp1b is added now uh, this either can be a latex particle or a platelet itself in uh, low resource laboratories washed platelets can be used for this purpose because we know that gp1b is present on the surface of a platelet now then to this platelet concoction you add risotecin and the patient sample so in the presence of risotecin your von willebrand will go and attach to the gp1b receptor and the amount of von willebrand bound there indicates how much of a normally functioning von willebrand is present in the patient sample okay so this again the normal range is 50 to 150 just like your antigen in type 1 because there is low antigen it is reduced in type 2a 2b 2m and uh, type 2a 2b and 2m it is decreased because there is a functional defect in von willebrand in type 3 again it is decreased because the antigen levels are reduced but in type 2n it is normal because platelet binding is normal in type 2n it's only the factor 8 binding which is defective okay so basically the take home point is that platelet dependent von willebrand factor activity also known as recoff reflects the functional levels of von willebrand factor whereas your wwf antigen levels refers to the level of antigen present in the plasma next the third test in this uh, uh, first line testing is factor 8 levels Uh, just like in hemophilia it's done with the one stage assay and this is what uh, uh, is responsible for prolongation of aptt in von willebrand disease patients in uh, uh, type 2a 2b 2 multima it's likely to be normal in type 2n and 1 it is low in type 2n it is low because the defect is in factor 8 binding in type 1 is it, it is low because the because of the quantitative deficiency of von willebrand factor in type 3 it is very low okay and uh, if there is a, a discordance between the factor 8 and the von willebrand antigen levels it suggests type 2n now what is the meaning of this sentence now let's say uh, there is uh, uh, 50 international units of von willebrand factor and uh, only uh, one international unit of your factor 8 so it means that though there is a normal level of von willebrand factor much of factor 8 is not bound to it that is possible only if there is a qualitative defect in the von willebrand factor also known as type 2 normandy whereas if uh, no, the von willebrand factor is also one and the factor 8 is also one it goes to say that the factor 8 levels are low because of a reduced antigen level of fact, uh, von willebrand factor and that happens in your type 1 and type 3 von willebrand disease so that is the meaning of this ratio next ratio we need to know is the uh, cofactor to antigen ratio now uh, uh, this is a very important ratio uh, which helps us to differentiate between quantitative and qualitative defects of von willebrand factor okay uh, in simple terms you take the ratio of the functional activity and the antigen levels so the functional activity is given by your recoff testing and the antigen levels from the von willebrand antigen and you take the ratio ideal in a ideal healthy person any amount of antigen is functional and therefore the ratio will be 
but in a patient with a dysfunctional von Willebrand, that is a qualitative defect in von Willebrand, though there is enough antigen or a normal antigen level, it is uh, not having enough functional levels. So the ratio will be less than 1. In fact, a ratio of less than 0.6 is much more specific for the diagnosis of a type 2 von Willebrand disease or a qualitative defect in von Willebrand disease. So, this is a uh, uh, parameter by which you differentiate between qualitative and quantitative defects of von Willebrand disease. So, that was about the first line testing in von Willebrand disease. In the second line testing, the first test is REPA. REPA stands for Christocetin induced platelet agglutination. So, this is a agricometry based test. So, I hope everyone knows about platelet uh, function defects and platelet agrigometry. Here, what you do is you add different agonists and you measure the degree of aggregation of platelets. Okay. So, this is usually used for platelet function defects, but this particular test is used for von Willebrand disease. And here the agonist added is Ristocetin. Now, what happens, as I already told you, in the presence of Ristocetin, the platelets aggregate. But there is a particular dose of Ristocetin at which the platelets aggregate, that is around 1.2 to 2 milligram per ml. So, this is the normal dose at which the platelets aggregate. Whereas in type 2B von Willebrand, there is an enhanced affinity of the von Willebrand to the platelets that even in the presence of lower concentrations of Ristocetin, this binding happens or this aggregation happens. So that is known as a low dose REPA. Okay? So, if you can see this graph, this blue line shows absence of aggregation and the black line shows the presence of aggregation. So, this blue line is a normal person wherein the addition of 0.5 milligrams of ml. So, this is a low dose REPA. In a normal person, 0.5 mg per ml does not trigger any platelet aggregation. It's a flat line. Whereas in a patient with type 2B von Willebrand disease, due to enhanced affinity of the platelet receptor and the von Willebrand factor, even 0.5 mg per ml of Ristocetin is sufficient to induce agglutination and this is known as a low dose REPA. Okay? So this uh, low dose REPA is useful in the diagnosis of a type 2B von Willebrand. The differential diagnosis in these patients is a pseudo von Willebrand disease, also known as a platelet type von Willebrand. Now, what is this? I told you that this type 2B is due to the increased affinity of the von Willebrand factor to the platelet. Now, the defect can also be on the platelet receptor. There can be a gain of function of the GP1B alpha receptor of the platelet. This can also result in increased binding and thrombocytopenia. So, this is known as platelet type von Willebrand disease. So, this will be the differential diagnosis in these patients. The second test in uh, uh, the second line testing is multimer analysis. And uh, um, uh, uh, as the terminology suggests, you are going to assess whether the multimers are there or not. And from the classification, we can recall that the presence or absence of multimers actually helps us to differentiate between type 2A and 2 multimer. 2A, there is a deficiency of high molecular weight multimers, whereas type 2M or type 2 multimer, there is no deficiency of high molecular weight multimers. So normally the multimers are of the size of 800 to 20,000 kD. Here you run, run a gel electrophoresis on sodium dodecyl sulfate and then you uh, resolve them into high intermediate and low molecular weight multimers. High uh, resolution is also possible but that is not required for usual diagnosis. Multimer analysis is a laborious investigation and not available in uh, uh, most of the labs across the country. So this is just a graph showing the uh, uh, multimer analysis. This is a normal patient where there is a uh, uh, low, intermediate and um, uh, high 
uh, molecular weight multimers. So this is low, this is intermediate, and this is high molecular weight. In uh, uh, TTP patient, you can see that there is a lot of high molecular weight multimers. Why? Because the Adam PS13 fails to cleave these high molecular weight multimers. In type 3, there is complete absence of the multimers because the protein itself is absent. In type 1, it is present but reduced in quantity. In type 2A, there is a complete loss of intermediate and high molecular weight multimers. In type 2B, there is loss of high molecular weight multimers because they have already bound with the platelets and got degraded. And uh, uh, in type 2M, if uh, it was available in this picture, you would have noticed that there is a normal pattern of multimers. So that is the utility of multimer analysis. Coming to the advanced testing, these advanced tests are, uh, I'm not sure if it is even available in India. So these are very rare tests used for diagnosing the very rare subtypes of von Willebrand disease. So the first one in this list is the von Willebrand factor, factor VIII binding assay. This is used to diagnose type 2 Normandy. So any defect in binding to factor VIII can be uh, 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 diagnosed with this test. This is again a uh, ELISA based test wherein you have anti von Willebrand factor immobilized on the ELISA plate. You then add the patient's sample and the patient's von Willebrand binds to this antibody and the secondary antibody is anti-factor 8. So that only those areas of the von Willebrand factor which have bound with the factor 8 will give the color reaction. So this enables us to understand the extent to which the von Willebrand factor has bound to factor 8. So this is used for the diagnosis of type 2 Normandy. The other points which help us to differentiate it from hemophilia A are the autosomal inheritance and the genotyping. So hemophilia has a sex-linked inheritance, whereas type 2 Normandy has an autosomal recessive inheritance. The next advanced testing in von Willebrand disease is von Willebrand factor collagen binding assay. This helps us to diagnose type 2M where there is a defect in platelet adhesion in spite of the presence of high molecular weight multimers. It's usually due to defect in binding of the von Willebrand factor to the collagen. So here what you do, you have collagen immobilized on the ELISA plate followed by uh, addition of your von Willebrand factor and then a secondary antibody against the von Willebrand factor is added and the color reaction is read out. So that was about collagen binding assay. Then the final uh, uh, step in the testing for von Willebrand disease ends with genotyping. The methods for genotyping are polymerase chain reaction, Sanger re uh, sequencing and next generation sequencing. Now, though it has been described, it has a lot of limitations, unlike in hemophilia. In hemophilia, there are only specific mutations which can be tested for, whereas in von Willebrand disease, the gene is so huge, there is a pseudogene and the defects are also spread over different parts of the gene. So therefore, it becomes very difficult to identify these genetic defects. Also, 30% of type 1 von Willebrand disease patients may not have any genetic mutations at all. So that is why there is a very limited role for genotyping in the diagnosis of von Willebrand disease. So this table actually summarizes the utility of the different tests in the different uh, subtypes of von Willebrand disease. So whatever we have discussed till now in the laboratory diagnosis is summed up in this table. So in type 1 von Willebrand, which is a quantitative defect characterized by partial deficiency, the cofactor activity or the functional activity is low, the antigen level is low, the ratio is equivalent, meaning that the functional and the antigen levels correlate and the factor 8 levels uh, may be reduced depending upon how much the antigen is reduced and the multimer pattern is normal. In type 2A, being a qualitative defect, the functional activity is low, the antigen is mildly low, 
However, the ratio is less than 0.6. Here it was equivalent, whereas here it is less than 0.6 because though the antigen is low, the functional activity is much, much lower. The factor 8 may be low or normal depending upon how much the antigen is lower. And there is a deficiency of high molecular weight multimers on multimer analysis. Next is type 2b, a qualitative defect. Here again, the function is low. The antigen is low because of consumption, but the ratio is less than 0.6 because it's actually a functional defect. The factor rate may be low or normal depending upon how much the antigen level is. And here again, high molecular weight multimers are absent because there is increased binding of these multimers to the platelet. Now, you can see that till now, type 2a and 2b are similar. But how do you differentiate both? There is a increased response to ristocetin induced platelet agglutination even on low dose ristocetin. Also, there is a thrombocytopenia in this patient. This is the point which differentiates between type 2a and 2b. Next is type 2 multimer. The function is low. The antigen is low. And the functional activity is much, much lower compared to the antigen. Factor rate may be low or normal depending upon the level of antigen. Whereas the multimer assay is normal in contrast to type 2a. In type 2 normandy, the function may be low or normal because uh, here actually the functional defect is only in the binding to the factor 8. So again, the antigen may be low or normal and the recoff uh, antigen ratio may be equivalent here. But the pickup point is that the factor eight levels are markedly reduced with a normal multimer pattern and the confirmatory diagnosis is made with the help of one millibrand factor factor eight binding assay, which will be reduced. Next is your type 3 von Willebrand disease, which is characterized by complete quantitative deficiency of von Willebrand factor. So this can be easily identified by the antigen assay where there are undetectable levels of von Willebrand factor. So this actually summarizes the testing for von Willebrand disease. So uh, now we are left with the treatment. So treatment can be a non-replacement therapy or replacement therapy. I'll just put a word on few of these things because the lab has an important role in some of these areas. So under non-replacement therapy, you have desmopressin, antifibrinolytics like uh, uh, your uh, tranexamic acid and also platelets and other local measures. In replacement therapy, what you do is you give the deficient protein. You either give plasma derived von Willebrand factor concentrates or recombinant von Willebrand factor concentrates. A word on desmopressin. Desmopressin is a synthetic analog of vasopressin and it actually elevates the von Willebrand factor by causing release from the endothelial cells through CMP mediated activation of the vasopressin 2 receptors. Now, what is the purpose of knowing this mechanism of action? This mechanism of action tells us that desmopressin is useful only in patients who have a store of von Willebrand factor in their endothelial cells. Otherwise, desmopressin is not going to act. Okay, so now how do you know if the patient has a store of von Willebrand factor or not? So that is what is known as the desmopressin response test. When you're planning to give desmopressin to a patient, you need to do this test wherein you give a therapeutic dose of desmopressin to the patient and then you measure the antigen level, the factor rate level and the recoff level at 0 hour, 1 hour, 2 hour and 4 hours. If the level increases by greater than 50 units per deciliter, they are responders and therefore they can be treated with desmopressin. Whereas if it is less than 50 international units, it uh, uh, says that there is no store. So who doesn't have a store? Type 3 patients. So it is not useful in these patients. And there is another category of patients wherein it increases initially at 1 hour, but later by 4 hours it decreases. This 
reflects a clearance defect and therefore desmopressin again cannot be used in these patients so that is the significance of doing a desmopressin response test it actually helps you to decide whether desmopressin is going to be useful to this patient or not so that was about uh, 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 von willebrand disease so we studied about the protein uh, the uh, classification of the disease the clinical presentation the laboratory diagnosis and uh, final word on the treatment now we move on to the second part of the talk that is hereditary fibrinogen abnormalities uh, though less common uh, very very less common compared to uh, your von willebrand disease it is important to diagnose these disorders because these patients uh, can present with uh, uh, very uh, protein clinical manifestations which need to be identified so uh, fibrinogen deficiency uh, is grouped under rare bleeding uh, disorder or rbd now this is again the initial picture wherein i was talking about the coagulation cascade and fibrin actually comes in the last part of secondary hemostasis wherein a uh, mesh is formed so the word fibrin should uh, uh, bring a picture of a mesh in your head so it's actually a mesh which reinforces the platelet hemostatic plug now how does it form this mesh so this brings us to the topic of the structure of fibrinogen so fibrinogen is a hexameric glycoprotein okay so it has six subunits two a alpha subunit two b beta subunit and two gamma subunit so because there are lot of subunits here uh, they started calling uh, this as a d domain uh, e domain and a d domain so if you are to represent a fibrinogen molecule you represent it as d e d okay so this is a fibrinogen molecule so what happens in the final stage of the coagulation pathway the final stage of the coagulation pathway prothrombin is converted to thrombin and this thrombin converts fibrinogen to fibrin now how does it do that thrombin actually forms a, a bond between the amino terminus of the a alpha and the b beta subunits okay so when this bond is formed fibrinopeptide a and fibrinopeptide b are released so this results in the formation of a fibrin monomer shortly called as ded so ded is nothing but a fibrin monomer now we need a mesh we need a polymer so how does this polymerization happen it happens in the form of d dd dd different bonds among different molecules okay so this again is brought about by thrombin fibrin polymerization and this bond is once again strengthened by factor 13a also uh, known as the uh, uh, clot stability factor this helps in reinforcing the bonds between the fibrin polymers so this is the structure of fibrinogen and uh, we all know that finally fibrin polymer is broken down by plasmid so this is the basic biology of the fibrin molecule so it circulates in the plasma at a concentration of approximately 150 to 400 mg per deciliter so among your different factors factor 1 uh, 2 3 4 up to factor 12 so fibrinogen is your factor 1 so this is the most abundant coagulation factor in the circulation uh, and it's present uh, in the uh, uh, levels of 150 to 400 mg per deciliter it is present in plasma but not in serum because it gets uh, consumed in the clot which is formed in a serum and uh, the levels of plasma fibrinogen also is influenced by various exogenous and endogenous factors it is also an acute phase reactant so it can increase with age obesity smoking and inflammatory states and it decreases with alcohol consumption so role of fibrinogen fibrinogen again has roles both in primary and secondary 
So in the primary hemostasis, in the step of platelet aggregation, the bond between two platelets is actually mediated by fibrinogen. So this is mediated through the GP2B3A receptor of the platelet. So fibrinogen binds to the GP2B3A receptors of two adjacent platelets and helps in platelet aggregation. Uh, and the second role, of course, you know, is in secondary hemostasis where it gets converted to fibrin and forms a mesh. Next, we come to the discussion on the inherited fibrinogen abnormality. So, again, I am limiting myself to inherited fibrinogen abnormalities. This doesn't mean that there are no acquired defects. No, there are a lot of acquired fibrinogen defects also which come under acquired coagulation disorders. So today we will be limiting our discussion to inherited fibrinogen abnormalities which can be again qualitative or quantitative just like our von Willebrand factor. Fibrinogen can also have qualitative and quantitative defects. Now, what are the qualitative defects of fibrinogen? Okay. The disorder is known as dysfibrinogenemia which means that the fibrinogen molecule is actually dysfunctional, can be inherited or acquired and uh, uh, it's usually autosomal dominant and these patients present with thrombosis. Now why does that happen? Uh, uh, because of the dysfunctional fibrinogen molecule, it polymerizes much more rapidly and it is also resistant to degradation by plasma. Okay, so different dysfunctional uh, mutations can result in different manifestations. Some might have ineffective polymerization, some might have increased polymerization. Now, let's say a patient with dysfibrinogenemia has ineffective polymerization. He will present with bleeding. If he has increased polymerization, he'll have thrombosis. If he has a fibrinogen which is resistant to degradation by plasmid, he will have increased thrombosis. So based upon which part of fibrinogen is affected, these patients can present with either bleeding or thrombosis. One more interesting fact is fetal fibrinogen has an increased amount of sialic acid and they are also dysfunctional in nature. So that is why if you are going to measure fetal fibrinogen by your usual functional assays, they usually have low fibrinogen levels. Okay, So dysfibrinogenemia is an autosomal dominant disorder. Next functional defect is hypodysfibrinogenemia where not only is the molecule dysfunctional but also the levels are reduced. So that is why it is known as hypodysfibrinogenemia. Again, these patients can present with bleeding or thrombosis. This condition can also be inherited or acquired. Uh, just a word on acquired dysfibrinogenemia, it's usually seen in liver disease. Next, coming to the quantitative defects which are much more common. Afibrinogenemia. Afibrinogenemia, complete absence of circulating fibrinogen. It's an autosomal recessive condition. Hypofibrinogenemia, it's, it's a partial deficiency. The level is less than 150 milligram. Now, based upon what is the level in a particular patient, they may or may not bleed. If the level is less than 100, they are likely to bleed. If it is between 100 to 150, they are unlikely to bleed. Okay, the other defect, quantitative defect is hyperfibrinogenemia. These patients have increased levels of fibrinogen greater than 450 milligram per deciliter and it's usually a transient finding which is acquired in the setting of inflammation and unlikely to be an inherited defect. So that was about the classification of the different inherited fibrinogen abnormalities. Now the clinical features. Fibrinogen deficiency, unlike other coagulation factor defects, they have certain peculiar clinical characteristics. Apart from the usual bleeding manifestations like CNS bleeds, uh, recurrent abortions, umbilical bleeds and hemarthrosis, these patients can also have hepatic dysfunction and cirrhosis. Now, why is that? Because in some patients with this fibrinogenemia, the molecule is so dysfunctional that it gets uh, 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 accumulated within the hepatocytes and they cause uh, liver cell dysfunction. Just like in your alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, the abnormal molecule accumulates within the cytoplasm of the hepatocytes and causes liver dysfunction. 
These patients can also present with spontaneous rupture of the spleen, though the cause is not known. And as I already described, these patients can present with thrombosis, both arterial and venous thrombosis. So it is important that you know all these features so that you can uh, work up for uh, fibrinogen defects in these patients. So what are the investigations you will do? Uh, of course, you need to measure uh, fibrinogen. Fibrinogen, again, can have uh, a functional measurement and an antigen level measurement. What we do routinely in our labs is CLOS assay or CLOS technique, which is actually a functional assay. Here, you actually uh, add an excess of thrombin and measure the time taken for the clot to form. So you're actually measuring the function of the fibrinogen molecule. So therefore, it is a functional assay. There are also PT-derived fibrinogen assays, which is based on the prothrombin time, whereas the CLOS technique is based on the thrombin time. You have an immunological technique where you're measuring the antigen levels and you have a gravimetric technique where you measure the clot weight, which indirectly gives you the antigen levels. So uh, uh, a point on the CLOS technique, which we routinely use in our lab, you add excess of thrombin and you measure the time taken to clot. And this time is converted to milligram per deciliter of fibrinogen by plotting it on a fibrinogen standard curve. So when do you uh, get a uh, prolonged clotting time? Uh, whenever there is a low fibrinogen concentration or whenever there are inhibitors such as heparin or circulating fibrin degradation products. So whenever you have a, a low fibrinogen uh, level, you need to rule out heparin contamination or DIC resulting in increased FTPs in the circulation. So how do you work up a case of uh, 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 possible fibrinogen defect? If the patient is presenting with a bleeding diathesis, we will go for a CLOS technique, which is the normally available assay. And if you are thinking of congenital fibrinogen defects, you need to rule out both functional and antigen abnormalities. So you do a CLOS technique and a clottable protein technique, which gives you the antigen levels and also an immunoassay, which is another antigen uh, level measuring technique. Okay, if you are suspecting DIC or acquired defects, uh, which is usually uh, 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 your uh, uh, reduced uh, uh, function as well as antigen, your CLOS technique is more than enough. If there are high fibrinogen levels, you can do either of the two. And if you are giving a thrombolytic therapy, you are concerned with the amount of residual functional fibrinogen so you need to do a clause technique so how do you confirm the diagnosis now let's say you have a patient with a fibrinogenemia the patient will have a reduced plasma fibrinogen both on a functional assay and an antigen assay or an immunoassay. But if the patient has hypofibrinogenemia, again, there will be low fibrinogen levels both on a functional assay as well as an immunoassay. Whereas if the patient has a dysfibrinogenemia, which means that the patient has a dysfunctional fibrinogen, the antigen levels will be normal, whereas the functional levels will be reduced. That is, the functional levels as measured by your clause technique will be reduced. So that is how you decide whether the patient has afibrinogenemia, hypofibrinogenemia, or dysfibrinogenemia. So that was about the diagnosis. Treatment, though you have recombinant fibrinogen, it's very costly and unavailable. So uh, what we use routinely is cryoprecipitate and uh, a routine blood bank question which is asked is how much of fibrinogen is present in one unit of cryoprecipitate. So around 200 to 400 mg can be present in a volume of 10 to 20 ml. So if you are planning to give cryoprecipitate to cover a surgery, you need to maintain levels of greater than 100 mg per deciliter for major surgeries and greater than 50 mg per deciliter for minor surgeries. So uh, that brings us to the end of this uh, lecture. Uh, to summarize, uh, von Willebrand disease was the first part and uh, it is the most common inherited breeding disorders and therefore you cannot escape reading about this disease. Though genotyping has uh, helped us to improve the patho understanding the pathogenesis, it has not contributed much for the diagnosis of the disease. 
The diagnosis is actually made difficult by the marked phenotypic variance. Therefore, a careful family history and a bleeding history is important. Don't forget to use your bleeding assessment tools and bath scores uh, and bleeding scores for the same. So, in a lab diagnosis, you need to do a stepwise testing. Low von Willebrand factor always does not mean a von Willebrand disease, always does not mean you need to treat it. And a recough is not ideal, though it can help to identify the functional defects in von Willebrand factor. So, management uh, uh, desmopressin response test should be done in patients with von Willebrand disease. Recombinant von Willebrand factor can be given. Uh, and routine prophylaxis right now is not available for von Willebrand disease, unlike in patients with hemophilia. Uh, uh, next, fibrinogen abnormalities. The different fibrinogen defects you need to know of are afibrinogenemia, dysfibrinogenemia, cryofibrinogenemia, uh, hypodysfibrinogenemia, and hypofibrinogenemia. The different clinical features are recurrent abortions, intracranial bleeds, umbilical cord bleeds. Apart from rarer manifestations such as liver cirrhosis and spleen rupture along with thrombosis, these patients typically present with a prolonged PT and APTT. Now why is that? Fibrinogen is the final common molecule involved in both the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway. So any defect in fibrinogen results in prolonged prothrombin time, prolonged activated partial thromboplastin time, and prolonged thrombin time. So uh, before you say that the patient has a fibrinogenic uh, fibrinogen defect, please exclude heparin contamination. And if you are to diagnose uh, dysfibrinogenemia, you require both clause technique and immunological techniques. And these patients can be managed with cryoprecipitates. Uh, so I thank you for your patient listening. Uh, any questions, I'll be happy to take. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, before I go for the questions, uh, you can stop sharing and we can have you on the screen to share your video. Uh, you must uh, have a glass of water. You must be really tired. No problem. Okay. Uh, let's hear from Dr. Nilesh Kapadia. Dr. Nilesh Kapadia is one of the very well known pathologists in Ahmedabad, Gujarat. And you just, uh, just listen to his comment. He has typed his comment on the YouTube, which I've copied on the Google Meet. He says, Best ever heard CME on von Willebrand disease. And then he goes on to add one more line after that, after some time, he says, I want more from her on coagulation disease. And then after the end, he says, this is, this webinar is indeed a webinar, one of the best webinar. I agree. Even your PNH class was so, so wonderful. And Thank this you, is equal, yes, very, you are an excellent teacher. Thank you, sir. And I bet on that. I don't know whether I live to see, but you will be one of the top players in India very soon. Thank you so much. The concept of uh, subject is tre tremendous. And the way you deliver it, it, under, it makes you understand that how good you know your basics. Wonderful. Your, your concepts are wonderful. This is going to be a real material for everybody to listen and learn. Thank you so much, uh, sir. You, people can't have you everywhere to teach, but then if if we have once things start moving if we have a seminar in Cal calcutta i'm going to call you to come and sure, sir. i'll be happy to come there very nice let me see if there is any question by yes. anybody on youtube i bet there aren't because everything is so crystal clear wonderfully done dr Kartika. excellent you, You're a wonderful teacher thank you Brilliant. sir we would definitely like to have you more and more on these so that you know the your concepts are so clear should be should be available for everybody to listen and learn the subject. My pleasure to share them, sir. I always believe that the young crowd is a better teacher than the old ones. Not that the old ones are no good. But then <laughs> the young crowds are really good. They are very well. And you happen to be one of the best there. Thank you so much, sir. There are no questions there on the YouTube. Uh, I think you must be really tired uh, the way you have taught us so wonderful. Please share the PDF of this lecture. Yes. We will put it up on the Google Drive. Yeah. 
thank you so much dr kartika for thank taking you. out time you must be really busy there amrita is a very big institute and thank you for taking out time and teaching us and i think uh, there are very many more lectures lined up we will set up the time as sure. for your convenience and we'll have you more on this platform just thank before you. i close let me share with you one small thing this is the 200th lecture of pursue great sir <laughs> so you you are the one who's who's decorating decorating it with the 200th double century lecture of pursue thank, thank you, you so much to be on this platform it's a pleasure having you here thank a real you real pleasure take care bye bye good night thank take care god bless you thank you sir